I <clears throat> heard a story of this fellow who entered a little country store. And as he's walking into the store, he notices this sign on the door that says, Danger! Beware of dog! Well, he goes into the store and he sees this harmless old hound dog curled up asleep on the floor right near the cash register. So he asked the store's owner, is that the dog folks are supposed to be aware of? And the owner said, yep, that's him. Well, the stranger couldn't help but be amused. He said, that certainly doesn't look like a dangerous dog to me. Why in the world would you put up a sign for him? The owner replied, because before I posted that sign, people kept tripping over him. Have you ever received a warning that you didn't take very seriously? Maybe it was a teacher at school that constantly threatened but never really carried through with her warnings. Maybe it was a coach that was warning and, and threatening and never really followed through. Maybe it was an overindulgent grandparent that promised and promised to spank, but they never could carry through. Maybe it was even something more serious than that. Maybe it was a doctor who told you and told you and told you to make some changes, but you haven't. Why do we do that? Why do we decide that some warnings just don't really need to be taken seriously? Well, it's either that we don't fear the consequences of ignoring the warning, or we don't fear the person who is issuing the warning. The mission of Amos was to help Israel hear a warning from God. But his mission was also to help Israel see the God of the warning. Because Israel's problem was not just that she didn't fear the consequences of ignoring the warning, she didn't fear the one who was issuing the warning. So look with me at the ninth chapter. I'm going to read the first four verses there. But I want, as we begin, I want us to look at just the first few words of Amos chapter 9, beginning in the first verse. We read this phrase. I saw the Lord standing by the altar. And I want to park here for just a second on this phrase because it's very important. Amos has deliberately chosen to begin his last sermon with these particular words. Why is that important? Well, about 180 years earlier, another Jeroboam had stood at the altar at Bethel. When the nation divided, the first Jeroboam said, that he didn't want the people to go down to Jerusalem to worship because they might reconnect with the kings there. So he set up altars in the northern tribes like, like Dan and Gilgal and Bethel. And he stood there by the altar and he said to Israel, you don't have to worship Yahweh in the temple. You can come to worship him and the gods that I have set up in my temple here. So Jeroboam is the king that introduced counterfeit religion to Israel. And every king since him has kept up this charade all the way to Jeroboam II, who is the king when Amos comes to prophesy. They used religion in the interest of politics. They used God as a prop of the establishment. So you can go back and see how it all starts. And twice you're going to read this phrase. The king stood at the altar. And now 180 years later, Amos says, I saw the king standing by the altar. The real king. The true king. And Amos knew what it meant. It meant that the decision to judge Israel has already been made. So let's read now the first four verses of Amos chapter 9. Follow along in your own Bible. It says this, I saw the Lord standing by the altar and he said, Strike the tops of the pillars so that the thresholds shake. 
Bring them down on the heads of all the people. Those who are left I will kill with the sword. Not one will get away. None will escape. Though they dig down to the depths of the grave, from there my hand will take them. Though they climb up to the heavens, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from me at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent to bite them. Though they are driven into exile by their enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. So what is God saying? It's really what he's been saying through the entirety of this book. And that is that God's wrath plays no favorites. Israel thought that she was protected from the wrath of God. And we know in the New Testament, it says that nothing can separate the redeemed from the love of God. Well, here, Amos is saying nothing can separate the rebellious from the wrath of God. Israel thought that her election gave her an e exception. They trusted this, this misguided sense of chosenness rather than a covenant pledge to righteousness. So the prophets would show up, not just Amos, but Micah and Hosea and Isaiah, and they would give God's warnings to the people. But the people dismissed the prophets' warnings to repent because they thought, you know what? We're God's favorite nation. So they treated God like a mascot. You've been to football games where one team is getting skunked 50 to nothing, you know, like uh, the Chicago Bears games usually go. And the cheerleaders are down there on the field, on the sidelines, and they're just still jumping around and they're doing all of their cheers because that's what they do. Doesn't matter what the reality is. Their job is to cheer for their team. And that's what they thought God was like. God is always going to cheer for us. Doesn't matter what's going on because that's God's job, to be our mascot. And Amos and the prophets would respond. What kind of God do you think you're dealing with? They treated Yahweh like he was some indulgent grandfather who nags and nags and nags, but he never intends to really enforce. But that is not the God that Amos saw at the altar. Notice in the vision that the worshipers are killed in the midst of their very own assembly right there in the temple where they have going, been going all of these years, putting up the charade and the sham of worship, God says, right there, it's going to come down. God will not be mocked. He will not continue to allow the belittlement of his name. He will defend his honor, and I'll tell you why. Because God's wrath displays his greatness. And you need to know something that you rarely ever hear get preached. God is not ashamed of his wrath. Like all of his other attributes, God's wrath reveals his glory. Just as his mercy does. Just as God's patience does. Or his faithfulness does. God doesn't have a bad day and say, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I was upset at the time, but now it's over. I'm all good. When God reveals his wrath... He does it for one reason, to show the world his glory. Israel's real problem is that they had lost sight of the real God. They ignored the warnings of God because they had lost their awe of the God of the warnings. You see, there is a reason why all throughout this book, Amos' favorite name for the Lord is God Almighty. All throughout the book, when he announces the judgment of God, he does it in a way to remind the people that their God, little g, is way too small. Look at Amos chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. He who forms the mountains, creates the winds, and reveals his thoughts to man. He who turns dawn to darkness and treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God Almighty is his name. His wrath displayed his greatness. When Louis XIV died in the year 1715, 
He had been on the throne of France for 70 years. He's the one who said, I am the state. He liked to be known as Louis the Great. So his funeral went just as he had planned it out. Thousands gathered into the cathedral and his body was down front in a golden casket, very ornate, with a single candle lit on it. Everything else was dark. The bishop walks in to begin the service and he leans over and he blows out the candle and he says, only God is great. Amos's God is an awesome God. And the main point of his last sermon is that's who he is. So let's look at this together. Amos chapter 9 verses 5 through 6 say this. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, who he who touches the earth and it melts and all who live in it mourn. The whole land rises like the Nile and sinks like the river of Egypt. He who builds his lofty palace in the heavens and sets its foundations on the earth who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. The Lord is his name. What is he saying? He's saying he is the God of all earth. And he gives you these poetic allusions to earthquakes and rainstorms and floods. In other words, he's saying, people of Israel, whoever gave you the idea that God takes naps, that God is in some rocking chair just passively watching his creation. He's not just the creator of the universe. He is the maintainer of the universe. Jesus said the exact same thing in John chapter 5 when they criticized him because he was healing on the Sabbath. He said, I'm working because my father in heaven is working to this very day. Where'd you ever get the idea that God still isn't at work in the world? He is the Lord of all the earth. He is active in orchestrating the great rhythms of nature. He takes credit for the way that the earth exists. This is our father's world. And he is an awesome God. Look at verse 7 of Amos chapter 9. Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Arameans from Kerr? Well, what is he saying? He's saying that he is the God of all nations. He's not just involved in the events that shake the earth. He's also involved in the events that shape the nations. In fact, in this verse, God claims to be active in the histories of some of Israel's bitterest enemies. Israel was not the only nation that God was involved with. He moved the Philistines to where it was that he wanted them to be. He, he moved the Arameans to where it was that he wanted them to be. Israel thought that there was a, a certain event in their own history, the Exodus, that, that put God in their debt regardless of their behavior. And God said, you think because I moved you from that place to this place that I owe you something? Who do you think I didn't move? Every nation on the earth is where they are because I put them there. No nation on our planet has a history that God has not been involved in. God's sovereignty is not limited by ethnic or geographical boundaries. Yes, God chooses nations, but God doesn't play Favorites. He doesn't view nations in light of their historical past. But hear this clearly. He views them in light of their moral present. And he holds the citizens of all countries accountable for their actions. Well, let's look together at verses 8 through 10 of Amos chapter 9. It says, surely the eyes of the sovereign Lord are on the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For I will give the command 
And I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations as grain is shaken in a sieve and not a pebble will reach the ground. All the sinners among my people will die by the sword. All those who say disaster will not overtake us or meet us. What is he saying? He is, he is saying that he is the God of all people. You remember back in chapter 7 when God said that he had a plumb line that he was going to set in the midst of his people to judge his nation. Now he says that he has a, a sieve that he is going to use to judge the citizens of the nation of Israel. And even though he decided that the nation of Israel needs to be punished, it did not mean that he would judge indiscriminately. He would take the people of that nation and put them through this sieve, and he would separate the cheater from the cheated, the violent from the violated. God is the God of all people. He would separate those who could have changed the system from those who happen to be ruined by the system. He hears the cries of those who have no voice. And that's why there is hope. Look at the last five verses of chapter 9. And we're going to finally hear some good news. Chapter 9 verse 11 says, In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. So what is Amos's last point? His last point is the God of all the earth and all the nations and all the people is the God of all grace. The God Amos serves cannot allow evil to have the last word, but neither can he allow destruction to be his very last move. So the last word of Amos to the people was that God has a future for Israel. No doubt the exiles took great comfort from this truth. It's really interesting and something that, that you probably wouldn't notice unless you were looking very carefully. But in, in Amos chapter 4 verse 12, when God says, prepare to meet your God. The only other time in the book of Amos when you see that phrase, I am your God, is in the very last verse. I will do these things because I am your God. Because his word of hope can be trusted as much as his word of judgment. Why is this hope something they can believe? Because it's not grounded in their character. God never says, you know, I'm going to bring you back because you're so good. God says, I'm going to bring you back because I'm good. And this hope is grounded in the character of an awesome God. And by the way, on this truth, the gospel depends. Because now I'm going to throw you a little curve, and this is a lot of fun. I've said to you before that, that Jesus is on every single page of the Bible. And that text that we just read from Amos chapter 9 meant a whole lot to the early church. They saw that promise of God of a, of a future for Israel as a clue of how the wrath of God and the, and the mercy of God could meet. You remember that in the early days of the Christian movement, all of the Christians were, were Jews. And there was quite a bit of controversy in the early days, bigger than, than any controversy in the churches that we have today have ever fought about. And, and the question was, can a Gentile actually be saved? Well, there was no question about whether or not Gentiles could be saved if they became a Jew first. 
Everyone agreed that if you accepted Moses, then it was very easy then to accept Jesus. But the big question was, do you have to go through Moses to get to Jesus? Do you have to go to Sinai before you can get to Calvary? And many people said, well, of course you do. Jesus was a Jew. I mean, he, was, he had Jewish parents. He was born as the Messiah. He lived, he obeyed the law. He fulfilled Torah. Of course you have to be a Jew to be a Christian. But there were some who said, no. We are saved by grace. We are not saved by Moses. We are saved by faith and trusting in Jesus. So they had this big conference because this issue had to get resolved. And literally the whole future of world missions depended on the conclusion. So they, they all got together and Peter stood up and he had a whole lot to say because he always has a lot to say. Paul stood up and he had a lot to say. Paul always had a lot to say. And James then stood up, the brother of Jesus. And what does he do? He quotes from the last verses of Amos. Look with me in Acts chapter 15, beginning in the 13th verse. It says, when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. Amos prophesied of a day when God was going to build a new community and it would be made up of citizens of all the nations. And James said, that's what he is doing right now through Jesus. Most of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. He shared in an interview once that he came up with the idea for the stories from the Chronicles of Narnia when he was a teenager, even before he ever accepted Christ. And those ideas just kind of, you know, the ideas about this magical place behind a wardrobe where there was this land that just kind of lived in his mind for many years. But then he became a Christian. And that is when Aslan, the Christ figure, entered into his story. And he wrote one time, I don't know where the lion came from or why it was that he came. But once the lion came, he pulled the whole story together. That's what James was saying. Jesus is, is pulling the whole Bible together. It's, it's all starting to make sense because now we can actually see what it is that, that God is up to. See, God had this dilemma. His wrath brings him glory, but so does his mercy. And God wants to love his children, but he cannot condone sin. How is his glory going to be revealed? How is he going to show wrath and mercy? Well, the answer is Jesus. Romans chapter 3. Verses 23 through 26. Part of this was read at the beginning of the service. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate 
his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. God's wrath and his mercy reveal his greatness. And at Calvary, God put both of those on display. At the cross, liberty and justice finally meet. Because our God is an awesome God. So for just a moment, I want to ask you to bow your head. And I want you to just ponder the cross. Where God was absolutely just and absolutely holy. And his mercy was poured out on anyone who kneels there. Take a moment. Think about the cross. God, what can we say? Accept that your wrath and your mercy, your justice and your grace is amazing. May we never see you as anything but awesome. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. And relents from